Today, we are joined by Matthew McGee, Head of Digital Content at the law firm Pinsent Masons. Matthew is responsible for its hugely successful outlaw program. Content marketing has been one of the cornerstones of professional services for decades, yet in the past 12 months, it has exploded into client inboxes, leaving many firms asking the question whether they should adopt a more strategic approach to their content programs. Matthew has kindly uh, agreed to join us today to share his thoughts on what a good content program looks like um, and who is best placed to lead those content programs. So Matthew, welcome. Thank you for joining the professionals. Pleasure to be here, thank you. Um, the first question I'd like to ask Matthew is, um, is if you could briefly introduce the Outlaw program to us and, and explain uh, just how it works. So Outlaw is, a, is kind of a brand we give at Pinsent Masons to our content marketing and, and, and our, our way of publishing. It's a place on the site that you go to, um, but it's also a team and it's also an approach. And, and both of those are, I think, really the differentiating factors between how Pinsent Masons approaches content and how most other professional services organizations do. So we're a team of people um, with backgrounds in journalism rather than law. None of us is a lawyer. Uh, we're all from various branches of reporting. Um, and that means that we can get content produced more quickly using clearer language, using all our combined expertise in how do you frame events and frame experts' thoughts in a way that does justice to those thoughts, but also is in a format that users want are used to, are familiar with, and a format that really highlights what is new and interesting about what's being said. Um, so that that's our expertise, and that's unusual. And it's really it's really testament to Pinsent Mason's um, vision that they've invested in this for so long. We've been going as outlaw, not as big a team as we are now, but we've been going for 21 years. And that's as big a commitment as I've seen in any other firm to to content as as, as a discipline to be performed by people with that expertise. The other big difference, and again, um, this is something where we're seeing other, other organizations move towards our way of doing things, is we've always published completely to the open internet. So we put our content on, that just sits on web pages and anyone can view it. And absolutely, we get the questions internally, why are we putting all this effort and resource into creating content that we give to anybody, whether they're likely to hire Pinsent Masons or not? And the fact is, and we may come on to some of this later, it's about how do you best reach that sm relatively small number of people who have an influence on hiring decisions for organizations like ours. And what almost every other organization does is they basically try and hide their content away. They only send it out by email to people they already know, or they put it behind usernames and passwords, or they lock it away in inaccessible formats like PDFs. Um, and you can kind of see the logic because that makes it feel special and like only certain people can see it. But it really undermines the primary purpose of content marketing, which is to get in front of people. So we know we get in front of countless, countless people who never hire us, um, but that's the most efficient way to get in front of the people who do have influence over those decisions. So there's a couple of ways in which we take a different approach to the rest of the market. And with the team of journalists that you have um, at Pinsent Masons, how, how, how does the actual process of creating content work? Um, in many firms, it would be the lawyers or the accountants um, that would create that content and the marketing teams would just be responsible for tidying it up and distributing it. I'm guessing it works quite differently um, at Pinsent Masons. So the really important thing about our content is, is while we have a content team working on it, the impetus to publish about something and the really important content related to that, so the thoughts and the analysis, all still comes from the lawyers. They are absolutely in charge of what we talk about and how we talk about it. All we do is we um, shape that, uh, help them develop their thoughts and help them express those thoughts in the way that gives them the greatest impact. Uh, and really, we, we work with lawyers in lots of different ways. You know, we talk on the phone or we just get notes via email or some people write, uh, you know, fuller pieces. Um, but we have a, you know, a, a kind of single consistent approach, which means that of the, I don't know, 40 odd thousand pieces of content um, that sit on the site, 
there's a really consistent tone of voice, a consistent register, there's a house style, and um, we make sure that we give those thoughts and that analysis the best chance of reaching the right audience and making the right impression. I, it, it, uh, it's absolutely fascinating what um, Vincent Mason's has done with its outlaw program, but I'm, I'm guessing it uh, many firms looking at that won't either want to replicate or have the ability to replicate what you've done. And I just wonder, um, what should marketing and BD teams be thinking about when looking to place greater strategic focus on their content programs? So I think the biggest thing you can do is to start thinking about how am I getting this content in front of the people I want to? And that's like, that's like the lonely middle child of content marketing. Um, it's thought about last, if at all. People who are not content professionals are so consumed by their decision about what's the right thing to publish and how it should be published and every little detail and what's the font going to be and what color is that headline and the production process. It's a very producer focused viewpoint. And then it's published and that's it. Job done. I can go away and move on to something else. Um, and that's really the wrong way around. You should always come at it with a user focused mindset. What does user want to read about? How do they want to consume it? How are they already consuming media and how can we put our material in the places they're already looking. The long and the short of that is that if you're relying on an email to a big distribution list of three or 10,000 people as the only distribution mechanism for your content, you're failing. Your content is effectively not distributed at all because we know as, the, as all, 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 our, all the other firms will know that that small number of people that everyone's targeting is inundated with this stuff in an already overflowing, busy inbox. This is a source of stress and annoyance for those people. They do not get these emails and go, thank goodness, I see I have this update from yet another one of my panel law firms. So you need to think much harder about what the consumption habits of those people are and how you can get into that space. Our approach to that is that we, we, we publish very quickly, we use plain language and, um, you know, we perform extremely well in Google so that we get in front of people when they ask for help on that subject. They're not necessarily asking Vincent Masons for help. They're just asking the world for help. And we try and maximize our chances of being the organization in a position to offer them our thoughts on that issue, which means you get in front of people at the moment when they need the help. And that's incredibly valuable. Other organizations might have different ideas about how to do that. And email should certainly be a part of it. But if the only thing you're doing is emailing it, and maybe putting it on some distant page of your website as a PDF where Google will never see it, then that's the first thing you need to think about. The, the second thing is, you're absolutely right, not every firm will be in a position to hire a large content team like Vincent Mason's has, and that, and, and that has built up over years. It was no, never a single decision. It's still a difficult decision to take. But bear in mind that uh, journalists are a kind of worker who's available on a freelance basis. You can get a content professional in at a you know a fairly reasonable cost on at first a fairly uh, informal basis to see if it works and then grow it from there and start building the case and building the evidence to make the case in your organization for more investment and more long-term commitment so it doesn't have to be an all-or-nothing big bang. It, it strikes me that content teams are both creators of content and also gatekeepers to content, sort of deciding on what clients should and shouldn't see. And, and again, I was going to ask, what sort of advice would you offer marketing teams on how they should manage the expectations of their fee-earning colleagues around content? And um, I mean, they are the subject matter experts after all. And I, and I can see it being a source of conflict in firms, uh, in some firms. Absolutely. There, there is a, a, a really natural and understandable tension there when you bring a specialist team in who says, we, if we want to achieve the results you want, we're going to have to do it a different way. And professionals might look around at all of their peers and see everyone doing tactic A, and we're seeing, no, no, we need to do tactic B. 
and there's comfort in numbers, right? I mean, the, they will go, well, this is how everybody does it. That must be for a reason. It must work. And you, sim you simply have to build up a case based on evidence and based on numbers. One of the wonderful things about digital marketing is it is infinitely measurable, um, so much so that it's easy to get lost in the numbers, but it is pretty easy to build up a case. Uh, you, you try doing it in this way, give it enough time to work, maybe choose one area to do it in, make sure you've got data about that area from a similar period in that year because audiences are cyclical. So there's no point comparing month on month. You want to compare this month this year with this month last year, and then just look at the results. And in my experience, it has always been ludicrously clear, which is the method that gets the best results and, and build it from there. So statistics is a, is a, really powerful way of changing people's minds but there is a culture change here and and that's never easy but you will find that there are, there are some people who are keen and eager to try something different and if it doesn't work fine we'll move on to something else so seek out those people build a profile with those people and you might find that colleagues look enviously on at the increased profile and come to you and say okay how how do we do that for my bit of the business I mean, I mean, that's uh, wise advice uh, across all disciplines of marketing in, in professional services firms, I think there. Um, a, a final question for you, Matthew. Um, what are the risks to firms that choose to ignore um, a, a greater focus or discipline around their content programs? So I think in, in any time, the risk is just a massive sunk investment with no return. Because I think what a lot of professional services organizations never really quantify, so never really understand, is that they are already making an enormous investment in content. Professional services firms produce, I mean, at times ludicrous amounts of content because that's how we want to demonstrate our expertise and build our reputation and, and almost define the business. Here is what we're talking about because here is here are the areas we work in because no two of these organizations are exactly alike. So you are already investing an enormous sum. It's just not an investment that shows up on a PL sheet because it doesn't go into, you know, people don't um, record their time when they're doing it necessarily. But this is senior people's time, people who build out at high fees normally. You have to ask yourself, is that the best use of their time? Um, and an understanding that this is costing you anyway. So you, you may as well invest a little in cash terms to save a lot in time terms, and it eventually becomes much more efficient. So the risk of that sunk investment is real in, the, in normal times. We're not living through normal times. We're living through times when person-to-person um, -person business development simply isn't happening. Uh, it will come back in some form. I haven't talked to anyone who says it will come back to the same degree as before we'll see the same amount of traveling to the same number of conferences. That is simply not going to happen. Digital marketing was always important, but it has been the lifeline for organizations in the past 12 months and will continue to be so. So again, if you, if you are missing out on those opportunities, just because you're married to processes which you've never measured, which nobody knows if they work or not, then you are turning your back on your audience and your audience is your market. And I don't think any organization can afford to do that in the difficult months and years ahead. I completely agree with you, Matthew, and I suspect many uh, marketing and business development directors uh, looking at this would agree with you too. Thank you ever so much for your time. and Thank you for joining the professionals.